Hello, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Bob Shrum, the director of the Center for the Political Future here at USC Dornsife. Welcome to all of you, whether you are with us in person or on Zoom or Facebook Live. I'm here to introduce a remarkable conversation. To paraphrase Betty Davis, being a mayor in the 21st century is not for sissies. And with us today, we have two leaders who are equal to the daunting urban challenges of our time. Uh, Michael Tubbs was a path-breaking mayor of Stockton who led a once beleaguered city into a genuine urban renaissance. He's also a spring 2024 fellow here at the center, uh, has agreed to open his study group today so more of us can hear from his very special guest. He's an amazing fellow, terrific study group, and I think you would all agree. Uh, Los Angeles Mayor Karen Bass, the first black woman to serve as mayor of Los Angeles, was elected in 2022 in a time when I think the citizens of this city were not sure whether to fear or hope for the future. Mm. She has moved decisively to deal with homelessness. And by the end of her first year in office, over 21,000 of the homeless were moved indoors. She's a champion of affordable housing, a voice for economic and social justice. She was on Joe Biden's shortlist for vice president after serving as a member of Congress for 12 years. Before that, she was majority whip and then speaker of the California State Assembly. We are proud to have both of you with us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's get right to it. Um, we are so lucky to have not just the mayor of Los Angeles, but someone who across the globe literally commands respect and attention because of her heart, her intellect, her problem solving, and her desire to really have government work for everyone. Um, so Mayor Bass, we're so lucky to Thank have you. you as our mayor, first of all. <laughs> Thank and you. And even luckier to have you join us tonight um, for a discussion. We have brilliant students with brilliant questions, so I'll ask a couple and then let them sort of take the rest of the show. So my, my first question for you, Mayor, is now you're the mayor of Los Angeles. Before that, you were a Congress member, chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, chair of the subcommittee on Africa. Before that, you were speaker of the House of the State of California. Before that, you started COCO. Before that, you were, uh, you were doing work in the healthcare space. Like, but at one point, you were a college student. At one point, you were just figuring it all out. So can you walk us through sort of who was Mayor Bass as a college student, and how did you begin to plot your path to the impact you're making today? This one? Should I take yours? Yeah. Hello, everybody. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me come. I, when uh, Michael told me what he was doing, I was happy to come, and also for Bob. Uh, and it's always good to come back home to USC. Uh, you know, I, I really and truly, even though a lot of people don't believe this, uh, never plotted any of my path, none of it. Uh, but when I, at a very, very young age, wanted to get politically involved, actually when I was in middle school is when I first started getting involved, and knew that I wanted to spend my life fighting for justice, but how, I didn't know. And so I went into the medical field. I was a nurse for a while. I went back to school. I were, uh, trained as a physician assistant. I worked at county uh, hospital. But after work, I was politically active. Because in the time period I was growing up, this was not a job. <laughs> you had to find a job. And so my political work was always as a volunteer. It never occurred to me that it would be a job. And it wasn't until I started Community Coalition that I got paid to do what I was doing for free. And to me, I always tell young folks, find something that you would do whether you were paid or not, because that's like the best place you know, to be in. And so let's fast forward to today. Um, you, nice perch in Congress, VP shortlist in DC, get to go to Africa, do the work you're doing there. Can you talk a little bit about sort of what you heard or saw or felt in the city that made you feel like I had to, you had to come back, number one. And then number two, what's the one or two things you're most proud of to have accomplished in the short time you've been mayor? Um, well, for, let me answer that question first. Uh, most definitely getting people off the street and people who, you know, said to me at a tent, I thought I was going to die here and I didn't know this was ever going to change. Nothing beats that. But um, 
you know, as I was making various transitions, what has driven me my entire life have been issues. Okay. Not jobs, I've never thought about it as a career. Uh, this is a, a calling, if you would. Maybe that's the best way to describe it. And so when I was working, I was actually teaching at SC, but the other campus, the campus, the medical school campus, I was on the faculty there for a number of years and taking students into the emergency room and teaching them how to uh, manage patients. But crack cocaine hit the Crips, the Bloods. We, it was the beginning of what we would later call mass incarceration. We didn't use that term then, but I saw it all happening. And uh, to me, the problems that were happening in the community was a health, a social, and an economic problem. But the only thing politicians were doing was passing legislation to lock people up. That profound injustice led me to start Community Coalition. And I will tell you, when I started Community Coalition, I had no idea what I was doing. And I tell that, and I say that to young folks, because a lot of times young folks think that they need to be trained to do everything they do, or they need to take a class, or they need to go get another degree. Sometimes you just do it and learn along the way. And frankly, that's what my journey over the last 15 months has been, too. Uh, in terms of knowing that I wanted to get folks off the street, but I could have spent six months planning the best program. Instead, I just said, this is an emergency. We got to get people off the street. So I started Community Coalition to try to fight against what would later become mass incarceration. And after I built the organization, I really wanted to build it, train another generation of leaders and leave. But uh, I got pulled into running for uh, state office. And what I realized is that if I went to the state legislature, I could work on the very same issues in Sacramento that I was working on in the community, just from a different vantage point. And the same thing with, uh, with DC. Uh, what happened in DC is the sitting congresswoman, uh, Diane Watson, said she was retiring and I was taking her seat. And I was like, <laughs> OK. Um, <laughs> But I was, I was really excited to do it because at that time, President Obama was there, the Democrats controlled the Senate and the House, and when I got there, we lost 65 seats and the Tea Party took over. And so it was like, oh, you got the booby prize. But, um, but anyway, I loved being in Congress and I especially loved the opportunity to do international and domestic policy because my first love was actually foreign policy. Um, and so to be able to do domestic and international on the same job. But uh, what pulled me back here was flashbacks to the 90s and feeling like homelessness was going to be the next excuse to lock people up. And that here we were again as a city, angry, demoralized, convinced there was no way out of this. And I was really afraid that we were getting ready to go back down a path that I had seen before. And I frankly felt I couldn't live with myself in my nice, cush job as a member of Congress. Um, it's really not a cush job, but you know what I'm saying. Versus t gambling everything and running for mayor in what seemed to be insurmountable odds. And like you always do, you beat the odds. And you're sitting here as mayor, and again, we are so excited for, for that. And you mentioned you've learned a lot in, in, in the 15 months, and we could probably spend <laughs> 15 years trading battle stories of what it's like to, to be a mayor. But could you share um, with, with the folks, like what are some of the biggest learnings or biggest surprises you've had in the last 15 months? Well, one, I think that it's helped me that I've never worked for the city before. Um, had only been to the mayor's office a couple of times. And the only time I was in city council was when I was bringing a couple hundred people from South LA to city council to either fight for something or against something. And I, uh, but I think in a way it's been helpful because um, I parachute in and a lot of what goes on I think is pretty crazy. Hmm. Whereas if I had been there for years it might have seemed normal. Uh, so j just the depth of the bureaucracy, I certainly knew the bureaucracy was there, hmm. um, was definitely a surprise. And then just also the magnitude of the city, all that the city does. You know, we own power plants, we own asphalt factories, where, you know, there's the port, the airport, all of these parts of the city that, uh, of course, I knew were there, not the power plants and the asphalt factories, but, but just the magnitude of, of uh, how big our city is. And now that I'm interacting with other mayors around the country, I've gotten involved in homelessness on a national level. I, I chair the uh, National Task Force on Homelessness for the U.S. Conference of Mayors. 
And as I've met mayors from around the country, it just reinforces how big and complex LA is compared to other places. And, and speaking of homelessness, we've been hearing a lot about Inside Safe. Um, the New York Times just ran an article about sort of the working leadership and the amount of folks we've been able to place into temporary housing from tents. And one of the questions or critiques of the program is mm -hmm. like what happens after? Mm -hmm. So could you talk, and, and again, sure. you mentioned launching and iterating and building it as you, as you fly, but could you mention sort of how you and your administration are thinking about what happens next, and what, be, what might be some of the barriers that can get across in a five-second soundbite or in a tweet as to why is that difficult to do? Sure. Uh, well, the other thing is that I come at this as an inter, as a, in a different angle because of my medical background. Mm -hmm. So uh, to me, what was most important is to get people off the street. And I don't know if our former city controller, Ron Galpin, will, will agree with this, but it seemed as though, you know, because he did great work identifying all of the uh, land in the city, you know, that was publicly owned. And uh, I took your work, by the way, and uh, we are planning to build on those properties. Fantastic. But, <laughs> But to me, the city and the county really were not committed to ending homelessness. And I think if that's not your goal, then you wind up just managing. And, and that the policy of, of housing first really resulted in, and nobody intended this, but it really resulted in you stay in a tent until we build a building. And to me, that was just unacceptable because for, for many of you that are, are young, your entire life, there have been people on the street. And, and it's just not the way it always was in LA. This didn't start until the 80s. I mean, you know, there were people on the street, but a handful. Never did you see people in this level. But in the 80s is when it started, and ironically for me, which is why I feel my life has come full circle, is that in 1993 in South LA, we were trying to take over motels then to get people housed. And people just laughed at us and didn't think much of it because homelessness then was just in South Central and uh, Skid Row. So nobody thought much of it. And you remember, those of you shaking your head, you remember it wasn't tents, it was shopping carts, remember? Right, and the shopping carts until the grocery industry came up with a method of technology so that you can't leave your grocery cart. I mean, you can't get to your car. That was because of uh, the unhoused population. And so um, getting people off the streets has not been a problem. People will readily leave, and that was important that we were able to dispel that myth. Because that's what people said to me all during the campaign, well, what are you going to do with the people who won't leave the street? I've not had that problem. We have the opposite problem. We have more people that want to leave the street than we have rooms for. But what we're doing is inside safe is an emergency measure, but there's a lot of problems with it. And I could spend the entire hour telling you all the problems, but let me just headline a couple. It costs crazy money to put an individual in a motel. I'm talking about thousands of dollars a month per person. That's crazy, okay? The other thing is, is that the bureaucracy has not allowed us to move people from motels into housing. And, and so it's, I describe it like I'm peeling an onion, because every time I find a barrier, I peel it away, and then there's another barrier. So I've been, if somebody had told me in the beginning, these are all the barriers, I've had to discover them you know, on my own. And so I've been chopping away at them one by one. But then there's barriers in the bureaucracy of people who resent what it is I'm doing. And that's why I'm very careful in not disparaging people who came before. Uh, because, you know, there's a lot of people in the system who feel like, look, we've been doing this for years and we're getting people housed and I don't understand what you're freaking out about. It's like, well, I'm freaking out because there's 46,000 people on our street and five or six of them are dying every single day. That causes a freak out. But if you've been doing this for a long time, you kind of acclimate. And I think it's really important, you know, not to. The biggest weakness, in my opinion, is the lack of services. And, or I would say this, is not the lack of services. Services are there, but they are not adequate from my point of view. And that's where my health background comes in. And so I've come to the conclusion that people that have done this work over the years are, are uh, experts in housing, but not necessarily experts in the people that need to be housed. So for example, I think anybody that comes out of a tent on day one needs a full physical with labs and a meeting with a social worker that day. 
um, obviously I'm not saying forced, I'm saying if the person wants to, because if you've been on the street, you got health issues and everybody just wants to talk about mental health and substance abuse. But I've met diabetics, I've met people with cancer, I've met people with all kinds of illnesses. Mm. And so we need to, to do that. But, but we have right now, when we take folks off the street and put them in motels, a community-based organization takes over and manages it. So we have contracts with, say, about 15 organizations. Each one of them has a different definition of how they do services. And to me, there needs to be standardization, there needs to be metrics, and it needs to be based on outcomes, not just process. Don't tell me how many people you house, tell me what happened to them. But the system is not set up that way. So some reporters think that I'm trying to, I'm either ducking or I'm trying to hide. It's not true. I mean, I'm very happy to be transparent, but the data, the mechanism to capture that data is not there. So while we're building the plane, we're building the data plane as well. That was a crash course. I hope you guys are taking notes. <laughs> Difference between knowing how to house people and knowing anything about unsheltered people, that's a distinction I've never heard anyone made. It makes so much sense that, yeah, you could build something, but do you know the people who you're building for? And maybe if you knew them, you would build something different or build it in a way that's more in line with what they need. The last two questions for, for but to, to the students. Can you talk about or walk us through sort of what's been your best day as mayor? And also, what's been your worst day as mayor? Hmm. I know I intend to ask that. It just came to me when you were oh. talking. It was a good question, though. <laughs> it's a good question. Uh, well, I, I, I mean, my best days are the days that I get to go out in the street with the team. Because I don't get to do that often. But I really like doing that, um, is going and talking to the people that are unhoused um, and watching folks get on the bus. It's a very emotional experience. People are crying. You know, the. Um, young woman that heads up this program in the office, uh, I've nicknamed her Harriet, because uh, that's what she's doing, she's saving lives. Mm. And she sees it that way. And we have an outreach team of about 18 people, and all, all of them have lived experience on some level. They were in the justice system, formerly addicted, trafficked, um, formerly unhoused, and they know how to do uh, this work. I think the worst days uh, have been, um, when we lose people. You know, uh, we've lost people in those hotels. People have died in the hotels. Um, but we, you know, we had a couple of police officers uh, take their lives, a firefighter, and I'm very, very worried about what's leading you know, to that. Um, so those are, those are the, the worst days. OK, who wants to go first? Well, Mayor Bass, thank you so much for coming to speak with us. My name is Brian, and I'm a second year public policy student here at USC. Um, I heard you touch on how vast and big the city is. You know, Wilmington is so much different than Winnetka. Well, what did I say about questions? <laughs> okay. Question right. Um, how, as mayor, are you able to address the needs of so many diverse constituents in this huge city? Well, I'm not. How about that? <laughs> you know, uh, the, it's not enough resources there in order to do that. And then when you talk about needs, one of the problems in our, in our region here is the division between the city and the county. So there's only certain things that we have the budgets to do. But, you know, my philosophy is if I'm not breaking a law, I'm going to figure out how to do it. So, <laughs> you know, the city doesn't provide drug treatment. Uh, and mental health, but uh, I found money in the budget that was supposed to go, it was uh, money that was gonna go to the general fund from the opioid settlement, and um, to me, you know, why not use that to pay for drug treatment? So, you know, we're, we're, we're doing that. But there's a lot of services that Angelinos need that um, we're not able to provide because it's in the county. Now, I've tried to establish a close relationship in the county uh, as opposed to a relationship where we're always fighting so that we can maximize those services. I'm very blessed. Thank you for being here. My name is Randy. I'm a freshman studying political science. I wanted to ask you, as an immigrant, uh, we've had a lot of problems with finding affordable housing. How do you balance the pressure of 
the competitiveness of immigrants looking for affordable housing as well with the situation that we're in? Well, I mean, they're Angelinos, so I mean, they're, they're, the competition, unless you are referring to the migrants, yes. is that what you're referring to? Not just normal. Okay, so that's a really good question that we're grappling with right now. Now, we've been fortunate in LA, we've not been like New York or Chicago, huh. so uh, the governor in Texas is not flooding the city with planes, but he has been sending buses, and the buses have been 30 to 50 at a time, and I would say 95% of the people that come here are here only in transit. So that's, it's been okay. But lately, if you've seen the LA Times articles, they are talking about people who are on Skid Row. So we're grappling with that now. In my opinion, I think these are two very different populations. And to me, they're more similar to a refugee population with very different needs. And I don't think that they should be um, manage that whole situation should be managed in the same way. I don't want to lump them in with the uh, Angelinos who are unhoused because it does not address their needs. So we're trying to figure out that right now. One thing is is that what, what happens in the Midwest uh, when you have a, a big uh, refugee population, the local population takes them in. And I think that there might be some possibility of that. We don't have a Venezuelan population here. We will, though. In five years from now, we'll have a Venezuelan population. We don't right now, which is the majority of the people are from Venezuela. Not all, but they want, tend to want to go to Miami, which just shows you how, um, I don't know, disingenuous what the governor is doing. If he, well, he could send them to Miami instead of sending them here, knowing that they don't want to be here. Thank you so much for being here, Mayor Bass. My name is Nivia. Um, I'm a senior studying public policy and economics. Um, I was really curious, in the bureaucracy that you mentioned, it's obviously very frustrating. How do you work to kind of implement innovative approaches to tackling these big scale issues while still working within the restrictions of the bureaucracy? Because you know what? I won't attack. You won't see me disparaging or attacking people. What my way of doing things, my own leadership style, is we're creating what we believe is a model, and then it's positive pressure, as opposed to negative pressure, and getting on TV and saying, you know, well, the county did this, and they don't look good for nothing. I'll tell you, <laughs> this is a digression here, but <laughs> when I was running, my campaign consultants were so annoyed with me because they wanted me to attack city workers. I absolutely refused. Huh. I said, why? I'm right. Why would I do that? Well, because everybody hates the city. Oh, good. <laughs> Let me add to so it. I, I just don't believe in handling differences that way. Oh, gosh. Um, Mayor Bass, thank you so much for being here. Um, hello, my name is Bright. I like to say Bright as in Bright Light. Um, <laughs> I'm a sophomore studying cognitive science, but I'm minoring in international relations. And I'm currently pursuing a research inter internship under U.S. Congresswoman Sydney Kimberly Dove, your successor and a fellow Trojan. Fight on! Um, it's about you want me to help? Um, <laughs> it's about um, researching the impact of eminent domain oh. on Los Angeles and its BIPOC communities. Huh? As you get to see, I think Los Angeles is one of the cities that were um, predominantly right. affected. Question. Okay, so my question, I think, would be twofold. Um, what kind of approach would you like to take in terms of addressing this issue as the city gets to embark on different projects before the Olympics? And do you have any specific plans as a mayor um, to address the historical impacts that eminent domain kind of has had on the fabric of the city? So uh, I don't want to go down the road of eminent domain. I really don't. And, and it's because of what I was saying at the beginning. It takes too long. You know, there's a lot of, uh, there's tenants in Chinatown that are upset being the housing development that they live in, and they want me to use eminent domain. And I just, one thing is, is that I don't believe you should ever lie to people. And I was not, even though they were very mad at me, I mean, they picketed my house for like three days. Uh, but I'm not going to lie to them. I'm not going to tell them I'm going to do eminent domain when I know good and well it's not going to be successful. And while I'm lying to them, they get evicted. I'm just not going to do it. So, uh, but in terms of the Olympics, we're fortunate that we don't need to build anything big. Uh, so there's not going to be a need for anybody. And the Olympics is in, is in four years. You can't do eminent domain in four years. So. Kind of a 
guys. My name is John. I'm a freshman uh, studying philosophy, politics, and law. Um, I actually wrote a paper on you last semester. Oh, my. I was actually uh -oh. critiquing uh, the Inside Safe program, but I figured since <laughs> you're here, I might as well ask you. Um, I'm just curious, when you're making these policies, how do you ensure that they are covering as much as possible, as many issues as possible? And when you notice that there are pitfalls or certain areas, like you said, like not enough services, how do you react to that? How do you respond uh, when fixing the policy? What did you get in your paper? <laughs> I got that. <laughs> you know, the first part about what you were saying, uh, how do you make sure you're covering everything? Well, I don't quite understand. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, like, when you're actually, so obviously you have, you're moving homeless people into motels. Yeah. But how, in that policy, do you also account for them needing medical services? Oh, okay. So okay. So, uh, you know, when you are doing what I've done, where you're creating something, you don't know. <laughs> Okay? I don't know what's needed. I'm discovering it along the way. I will tell you that when I first started in the, in the community-based organization said they provided services, I automatically thought they provided health care and a social worker that day. I found out along the way, maybe, maybe not. I found out along the way there weren't like set standards. Um, I found out along the way that the social worker might not be there for a week or two. I'm so grateful that no motel has been burnt down, really. Because I know that we're putting people in these motels that shouldn't be there. So that's why I've been on this crusade. I mean, it's been driving me crazy, literally. Anybody that works with me knows. You can ask Joey, he'll tell you that it's been driving me crazy. So that uh, my resolution for it is I've hired a medical doctor. And uh, I've hired her to be the deputy mayor for homelessness. Because again, I realized that the people in the field really didn't necessarily focus on the population and their needs. Um, so as I find these problems, I try to resolve them. Right away, I knew it was too much money, OK? <laughs> uh, but what the city needs, in my opinion, is a system of long-term interim housing. Because even though I've signed executive directives to fast-track building, it still takes months. And I just think it is a gross uh, um, it's just gross to say you stay in a tent while I'm building a building. Now, tiny homes I don't think are good in terms of somebody staying there for a year, year and a half. But the new, but the market is changing things. And so, for example, there's some better examples of tiny homes. There's one where it's not that tiny, first of all, and it has a bathroom and a kitchenette. Because I think you've got to have a bathroom. And I especially think of that from a gender point of view and gender violence. And I worry that what I've seen in the tiny home uh, villages that the women can be uh, at risk. So uh, does that make sense? I mean, I again, I literally could fill up your entire hour telling you all of the pitfalls. Uh, but just because there's all these pitfalls, you don't stop. You don't say, well, you know what? This is a problem, so I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm going to keep getting people off the street and keep fighting to improve the program at the same time. You should let me see your paper, by the way. <laughs> Thank you for coming. I'm River. I'm a political science student at USC. I'm a junior. Uh, so I'm from the San Gabriel Valley area, and I've noticed canvassing there. I've met a lot of people who seem to have what Beth would call compassion fatigue. Yes. They've been dealing with homelessness, especially. That's so right. So long. They've been living there for decades. They That's need right. To stop caring about the unhoused population. That's right. How bad of an issue is this, and what can we do to mitigate it? Well, it was the reason why I chose to run. That compassion fatigue leads to very bad policies because that's what happened before. And people didn't even want to look at the root causes of anything. People just said, these are bad people. They are bad young people. They're a lost generation. They're never going to amount to anything. Just lock them up. And that, to me, was what we were on the verge of. So that is also one of the reasons why I immediately focused on street homelessness, because it didn't matter, it doesn't matter, if I were to build 500,000 units of housing, as long as they were tents, people would say, you've not done anything. And, and so it's just really, if you don't deal with that, I mean, I believe the reason why people are on the streets today is because of very bad policy decisions that started in the late 80s and went, and where we eviscerated social services, and then went, oh, surprise, surprise, 
now we have all these problems on the street. Then what we do is, is that we expect the police to deal with it. And I don't think that police that recruits go to the academy to deal with substance abuse, mental illness, and homelessness. But we let everything fall through the cracks when we eviscerate programs and then we go, oh my God, we need somebody to come save us. Hi, Mr. Bass. Uh, I'm Shiva. I'm a senior studying business. Uh, thanks for being here. My question is, uh, as this is your first executive role, right, uh, in politics. So I was wondering how is Speaker was pretty how executive. Is being, <laughs> how is being in like a direct executive role change your like perspective and your views on political leadership versus being uh, like one of many as a common person? Well, after I spent two years as speaker during the Great Recession and had to make $40 billion of cuts and eviscerated all those things I just talked about, <laughs> um, I was happy to go to Congress and be one of 435. I was like, wow, the pressure is off. Um, but I, I spent 12 years doing that. I'm very happy in an executive role. I like to make decisions. I am a risk taker. I consider myself a constructive disruptor. And, um, and I think one of the problems with politicians is that politicians uh, win an office and then they're focused on what their next office is going to be. And I think that's a real problem because the minute you do that, then you compromise your ability to take risk and make certain decisions. So for me, I'm comfortable in saying that I'm going to run for re-election. I'm done. That's it. I'm not aspiring. I'm not doing this so I can do something else. And, uh, and frankly, when I was in Congress, that was my attitude. And when I was in Sacramento, that was my attitude too. My belief is, is that just work, just do your job, do a good job. Opportunities will present themselves. If every time you're in a job, whether it's elected office or not, you're in that job so you can do something else, then I wonder whether or not you give your job the, your all. How's it going? Uh, my name is Calvin. I study economics here at USC. Um, and so my question is just about, um, talk briefly about um, the public land that we're planning on building on in Los Angeles. Can we talk, can you talk more specifically about um, what exactly is the model that we're using to build on that public land and what the future of affordable housing looks like and uh, anything else you might want to add to that? Sure. Uh, and thank you again, by the way. You canvassed for me. That's very nice. <laughs> Um, you know, what we're doing with the public land right now is we actually are going to experiment with RV storage because RVs have become a humongous problem. And so two things with RVs. One is to get people out of them because you probably know most of the people in the RVs don't own them. There's always a bottom feeder that is going to come and try to make money off of somebody else's misery. And so they call them van lords. These people go by broken down vans and then um, uh, RVs. So we want to hopefully get people to leave the RV, go into housing, and we take the RV and store it on a lot. The other thing for the RVs that do work and people do own them and they don't want to leave them because some people in RVs do not consider themselves homeless. So then we want to have an RV park, a trailer park, if you will, but uh, a place where there could be 24-hour security proper waste disposal, because that's the biggest thing in the neighborhoods, and then also services and, and other things that people might lead, need. In terms of the model of interim housing that I'm looking at is the model that I described that is the expanded tiny home. There's a, a wonderful facility that Eunices Hernandez opened in her district. Um, what, it's called New Beginnings, and that is with the ones that are, are larger. It's enough for two people. And um, you know you have the individual bathroom and, and a kitchenette. So we're going to be looking at something that can be put up quickly. The, you know the biggest problem is to me, it's clear how to solve this problem, but the biggest challenge is the scale. You know I go to these other cities and they talk about their homeless population and they're wringing their hands and talking about how terrible it is. I was listening to the mayor of Boston talk, and you know and. <laughs> And then when she was done, she was talking about 300 people. I'm like, oh, <laughs> I can do that in two weeks. <laughs> 46,000. So I've not cracked the nut of how we get to scale. But you know, I have obsessed on that building everybody's graffitiing up. Yeah. See, I've been obsessed about that building since I took over, long before the graffiti started. Because I'm like, you know, the guy that, I mean, the guy's a criminal. 
he's a fugitive in China. He's the one that bribed uh, Wisar. Just like, you know, if it was, you know, somebody else's house in South LA, they use asset forfeiture. I'm more interested in asset forfeiture than I am eminent domain. Hi, Mayor. Thanks for being here. I'm Dor. I'm a philosophy, politics, and law student, and I'm double majoring with cognitive science. I'm a freshman. Long That's a lot of subjects. Yes, lots of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Many things. Um, you mentioned mass incarceration earlier, and that's something I'm interested in. So I was just curious, like, do you think, how do you think, like, the trends in mass incarceration have, like, changed over time or have stayed the same? And then also just something I'm thinking about that I'd be curious your opinion on is, like, I read an, uh, an article from my law class recently kind of talking about how the war on drugs was like a main driving factor of it was. Mass incarceration. It was. And especially affected the black and Latino communities. So I was curious how, do you think that's still a m big issue here in LA in terms of incarceration and how do we address that? So yes, that was uh, why I started Community Coalition because I was just devastated of what crack was doing. Uh, crack was the first time, by the way, there was a drug epidemic that women used equal to men. Hadn't happened before. Mm. And so when that happened, what that resulted in was the breakdown of, of the uh, family. And then you had a huge increase in kids being pulled into foster care. So I didn't know anything about foster care before then. But uh, my problem when, when crack hit was uh, white middle class kids were using cocaine. They were using powder cocaine. They were also driving over here to South LA to crack houses, buying crack. But yet when the laws came down, they came down disproportionately on black first and then uh, Latino uh, population. And you guys all know this, the disparity in sentencing of powder versus you know, rock. Um, the, the fact that, in my opinion, cocaine addiction was a health problem. And instead of providing drug treatment, during those years, people are more sophisticated and understand addiction better now. But during those years, it was viewed as you just weren't disciplined. You just had, you had bad families, you had, you're bad people, and you have no discipline. That's why you're addicted. Uh, because I came at it from a medical perspective, I also understood the physiology of addiction and brain chemistry and all of that and felt like here was a classic health problem that one side of town people were being incarcerated. At the same time, South LA was uh, having its problem in Pacific Palisades. The kids up there were flying off the cliffs and um, you know, using powder cocaine. No one talked about locking them up. And then if you talk about uh, current the Oxycontin uh, epidemic and opioids, you know, it hit the white community first, actually, in a massive way. You, tens of thousands of people dying. No one ever talked about incarcerating them. No one did. But now, objectively, science knew more now than they did before. But the benefit of the doubt was given, depending on your class and your racial uh, background. So now the tide is turning a little bit away from mass incarceration, and we're beginning to release people. But I'm really concerned about that, too, because I think we're doing it in a piss poor way. And I tried to fight in the years that I was in Sacramento. You have to uh, re-enter people, reintegrate them. And what, what politicians did during the years of the war on drugs and mass incarceration, everybody, every politician wanted to have something on their mail piece that said they were tough on, on drugs, tough on crime. And so we passed laws that locked people up. But we also passed laws that blocked people from integrating back into the legal economy after they got out. And so the problem that I had in Sacramento when we were beginning to downsize the prison population, we didn't put anything in place to reintegrate them. So if you want to go take a survey of tents, there's a percentage of people in those tents that were released out with nowhere to go. They can't rent property because they've been you know, offended. I mean, they've been incarcerated. They can't get a job. You know, and we set people up to go back into the illegal economy. I'm Mayor Bess, my name is Sam, and I'm studying international relations here at USC. Um, my question is, um, throughout all of your offices, you've served an incredibly diverse electorate, and so I was wondering how you make sure that you're open um, to hearing all the opinions um, and perspectives that are representative of your constituency. Because I seek them out. 
I, do, I am not passive about it. I actively seek people out. I go to communities. Now, I'm a little disappointed now because, you know, in the past I've always had town halls. I mean, I love doing what we're doing now, uh, you know, having a conversation. But now, you know, there's this whole thing going on uh, where town halls are shut down. And so it's now it doesn't allow me to, to have to do what I did all the years I was in Congress and in the State House. I'd have big town halls. They were always rowdy. But, you know, I mean, that was part of the fun. But they were never, like, violent or hostile or people shutting it down. It was just people, you know, disagreeing and, and having conversations. So, but I actively, systematically go out, especially in communities where I feel I don't have a lot of support uh, or communities where I know they, you know, not so sure about who I am. <laughs> uh, I, I actively go out to those places. I was wondering what you're advocating for as mayor to make Los Angeles more sustainable and address the environmental challenges ahead. Well, you know, that's a real good news story, especially coming out of 12 years of Washington, D.C. I mean, nobody's debating climate change here. <laughs> nobody's debating immigration here. There's a lot of things we don't even debate. And, you know, and I spent 12 years, you know, trying to convince people that climate change was actually a problem. Remember when the guy brought snow into the Senate and said, see, it's cold. <laughs> um, but so I'm very lucky in the sense that the two previous mayors, Mayor Villaragosa and Mayor Garcetti, uh, really established a, an amazing foundation for me to follow up on. So drastically different than homelessness, I don't have to invent anything. Uh, I don't have to experiment with anything. I can follow through with their plans. Now, I believe that policy, no matter what it is, needs to be evaluated. And that's another problem, by the way, with legislation. People pass laws, no metrics, no evaluation, no sunset, goes on forever. Anyway, uh, so even though I feel they did a great foundation for me to follow up on, it doesn't mean that it's not evaluated and studied and tweaked and all that. strategies regarding public transportation. Regarding what? Public, public transportation. Oh, transportation. Semester, we, were, we had a fellowship with Betty Lee, and mm -hmm. we touched about that a lot. So I wanted to see what your perspective on that was. So uh, when I took over, I didn't realize all these other jobs came with it. And so, <laughs> so the job I'm in now is I chair MTA. And, uh, and so public transportation is uh, very important. And again, the last two mayors in Measure M and Measure R and all the things that they did have a roadmap for me to follow. Uh, but I would love LA to be uh, one of these days a city where you could go anywhere with public transportation. Uh, I know we're you know, getting bike lanes and doing, and I'm a bike rider, but you know, I, don't, I don't ride in traffic. I ride on the beach because it's too dangerous. But anyway, it shouldn't be that way. I mean, I like that the, the bike lanes in DC are nice because uh, they're, they're barriers. You know, sometimes the cars are set off from the street, from the curb, and then the bike lane becomes between the curb and the bike. I mean, between the curb and the car. And so, you know, you have a definite uh, barrier there. And uh, so we could make bike riding, I think, safer and come up with different modes of public transportation in addition to buses and trains. Well, good job, you guys. Really good questions. Um, so before we close, three quick questions. One personal, one political, and one Olympic related. Um, so let's start with the last one first. How was Paris? I know you, what did you learn? What can we expect for LA um, as we prepare for the 2026 Olympics? Mm -hmm. I'll do that. Want to do all of them right now? Yeah, go okay. ahead. Um, I'll write it down. Okay. <laughs> and my political question is, I remember when we held the event for you, it was the same day the tapes came out mm. um, and really talked about sort of some people's worst fears about what was happening and started conversations behind closed doors uh, regarding race relations in LA, particularly black and Latino relationships. But you've spent your whole career organizing everyone, but particularly building solidarity between black and Latino communities. So can you talk about that 
as a political strategy and sort of now as mayor of LA, how is that part of your approach to governance? And I forgot what the third one was going to be. But it was a good one too. I think. Oh, good. It was personal, so we can avoid that one. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually about to graduate. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I became a grandmother for the third time yesterday. How about that? Yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Yesterday was just fun. I'm leaving from here to go see him in the hospital. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> so Paris, Paris was, was good, but I mean, Paris was 100% work. I mean, uh, people think you might sightsee. My sightseeing was in the car going from meeting to meeting, looking out the window. That was south sightseeing in Paris. And uh, we took a team of reporters with us because I really wanted to use the trip to kind of energize, get people thinking about the Olympics here, because it's so far away. It's four years away. But actually, in 2026, we have the All-Star Game in basketball. We have uh, the World Cup. We have eight games in the World Cup. We have the US Open for women in golf. 2027, we have the Super Bowl. 2028, we have the Olympics. So we got a lot going on in, in those years. And uh, I went with uh, three members of the city council, the council president and the chair and the vice chair of the ad hoc committee on Olympics. So I think it was very eye-opening for us. I think in a way it was kind of like, you know, we got water poured over us to say, ooh, this is really going to be a big deal. So glad we went. I will go back for the opening. In the closing, I have to go back, which this will be fun. I have to take the uh, Olympic flag and torch from the mayor of Paris, who also happens to be the first woman mayor of Paris. So I'm going to take the flag, and then there's going to be this whole Hollywood production of the flag coming here, and Tom Cruise, and who knows what else. Uh, you know, we have, we have to do Hollywood. That's right. That's, that's who we are and what we do. Um, and then in terms of uh, race relations, uh, I have, I mean, I've, you know, was trained as a community organizer at a young age, and when you organize, you organize whoever opens the door. And so uh, to me, it has always been, since I was a kid, it has always been about pulling people together of different cultural race, class backgrounds. If you want to bring about change, if you want to have power, you want to bring everybody together. Uh, it really comes down to simple arithmetic. You're obviously a lot more powerful in a coalition than you would be um, individually. Any last words before the chosen rank here? Um, well, I want to recruit all of you to come work at the city. You know, we have internships and opportunities to be involved. And that's one thing about uh, your generation is you learn through, you get exposed through internships, which I think is good. It's good to go try something out before you decide to sign up for your graduate program or whatever. Make sure you know what it is you want to do. But I am a very, I view that it is my obligation <laughs> Well, I've always viewed this, but I especially view it now, is to make sure that the next generation is prepared to lead. And uh, you guys have incredible technology and tools, but they're not always the most positive. And uh, I've tried to tell some of my younger colleagues when they got elected to the Congress that your Twitter followers are not your voters. And, uh, and following your social media fo following, I mean, that's good, but you know, having human contact and doing the basics, I think, is, is far more, or, or rather, more long-lasting to lead to change. So thank you for the opportunity to come and speak with you. Mayor Bass, thank you. I, I think we spent the last 45 minutes learning about leadership. You taught us the importance of coalition building, mm -hmm. but also more importantly of launching and iterating. It doesn't have to be perfect for you to start. No. And there's no failure in admitting you didn't know everything. No. Crystal ball. You can peel OJT, on-the-job training. <laughs> Just do it. You, um, <laughs> you also started this conversation, particularly for the students in the audience, talking about how you had a sense of purpose and calling, but it wasn't about a position. No. It wasn't transactional. It was, I'm going to do this to get to there. No. It was, I'm going to do the best job I can today, and opportunities will avail themselves to me. Right. And then you also talked about like, what it's like to be mayor. That, yeah, you go to Paris, but that ain't a vacation. That's work. You in meetings and not sleeping and barely right. eating, getting croissant on the go and sightseeing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, and again, I, I think particularly as um, a former mayor, I, I can't, and knowing all the mayors, I can't think of any mayor I'd be more comfortable 
with raising my family in their city than you. So oh, thank you for your thank time. You. And congratulations thank on your you, grandchild. Thank you. And I look forward <laughs> to seeing you soon. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>